Hello, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Great. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're incredibly honored today to have um, Anna Singh and Donna Haraway. Um, I'm Maureen Ryan, Deputy Director of the Center for 21st Century Studies here at UWM. Just a couple of brief things to say, and then I will turn it over uh, to our speakers. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Ojibwe, Peoria, Potawatomi, Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. The Upper Midwest is still home to these nations, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and live among them in this place. Um, for those of you who have never been to a Center for 21st Century Studies event, welcome. Um, we, just to give you a brief description of who we are and what we do, um, we were founded in 1968 as the Center for 20th Century Studies. Um, our name changed at the millennium, the turn of the millennium, um, because we weren't done yet. Um, for 50 years, we've served the UWM and Milwaukee community by fostering and supporting innovative research um, on behalf of our, on the part of our faculty and students, and by presenting lectures, conferences, and events that explore the most press, pressing issues in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. So the programming year is nearly over at this point since the semester is close to being done. Um, but I wanted to let you know of our last event, which is our annual conference this year devoted to the theme of insecurity on May 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Um, the conference is an interdisciplinary look at insecurity, this concept of insecurity, um, as the defining condition of our political, ecological, and cultural moment. Um, we have incredible keynote speakers lined up, including Saskia Sassen, Mark Nucleus, Annie McClanahan, Naomi Pike, and Jennifer Doyle. And uh, we'll have a whole host of breakout panels as well, so it's sure to be really Productive and interesting. If you're in um, the Milwaukee area, please uh, please come if you're able. Um, we have information about that on our website, which is c21.uwm.edu. Um, you can also follow follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, we do a pretty good job of posting about our upcoming events um, there as well. So feel free to find us. Um, so now I would like to introduce our speakers. We're truly lucky to have them with us today, um, not only because they're incredibly important thinkers of the 21st century, but also because one of the things that C21 values the most is interdisciplinarity. And um, Donna Haraway and Anna Singh are truly interdisciplinary scholars in a way that is, um, I think, meaningful across the many disciplines that they speak to and also particularly urgent for um, the 21st century. <laughs> So Donna Haraway is Distinguished Professor Emerita in the History of Consciousness Department at the University, oh, excuse me, and in the Feminist Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz, which, where she has taught since 1980. She's a PhD in biology and has been called a multi-species feminist theorist. Her publications um, include many landmark works, including a manifesto for cyborgs, Primate Visions, Gender, Race, and Nature in the World of Modern Science, which was published in 1989. The Companion Species Manifesto, Dogs, People, and Significant Otherness uh, from 2003. And more recently, Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin in the Thulu Scene, which was published by Duke in 2016. Anna Lowenhaupt Singh is Professor of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her work brings together ethnography, cultural theory, um, anthropology, ecology, gender studies, Southeast Asian studies, to ask questions about human cultures and the ways in which they interact with the natural world. She's published over 40 articles and is the author of three books, In the Realm of the Diamond Queen from 1994, which won the Henry J. Benda Prize in Southeast Asian Studies, Friction, an Ethnography of Global Connection from 2005, which the American Ethnological Society honored with its Senior Book Award, and more recently, The Mushroom at the End of the World. So please join me in welcoming both of them today. So first of all, thank you for this invitation. It's a real privilege. And it's always been uh, just a tremendous lot of fun uh, 
to work with Anna, we did three graduate seminars together under the label of geofeminisms, one, two, and three, and I think tend to regard most subjects as branches of feminist theory, uh, which I think this is, a, in some sense, a continuation of. Uh, working with Anna has been one of the pleasures of my life, beginning with the work in the realm of the Diamond Queen and her botanizing with one of her teachers, uh, Uma Adang, an older woman, uh, with whom the, um, uh, the naming of the, of the plants and animals and others in, in the world that uh, Uma Adang was teaching Anna about and the naming, the questions of naming and taxonomy as that um, becomes a, a, a way into, into the love of place, into connectedness, uh, and into ways of thinking natural history otherwise without disavowing or repudiating or being silly about the inheritance of Western natural history, but a kind of uh, embracing of natural history otherwise that enlarges the world as opposed to, uh, by taboo, restricting it to one or the other. Uh, and I think I have learned from Anna uh, and uh, the Diamond Queen, Uma Adang, for many years. And so it's a privilege to continue that. So Anna and I were in a conversation together in uh, Denmark at the University of Aarhus, uh, where Anna was, uh, had begun a uh, multi-year project um, on the questions of the Anthropocene with both biology and anthropology and other colleagues, both in Denmark and the United States. And in a collective conversation that we were having about the urgencies uh, that we are all living within and all in some sense are accountable for and to, we, uh, we proposed the term plantationocene um, the, as pro in, uh, in a really significant way the fundamental revolutionary transformation in unequal and what Anna will describe as patchy ways, but truly globally uh, the invention of the plantation as an apparatus of natural social um, redoing of worlds uh, was rooted in certain uh, fundamental uh, processes and projects that underlie uh, the history of capitalism, that underlie the history of industrialization, that underlie the Anthropocene, and that are not done. The plantation is seen as an entirely contemporary event, event space. Um, and we wanted to think with that and see what we could do uh, within that category, again, not so as to toss out others, but, to as, but so as to foreground background differently. And there are certain aspects of the plantation of scene that I want to cite before turning things over to Anna, and they are the following. The plantation system or the plantation of scene depends first on radical simplification, the elimination of whole categories of players, a radical simplification of players in any system uh, set of enc systemic encounters. So first, radical simplification. Second, radical substitution, such as uh, whole, uh, whole domains of plant life, whole domains of animal life, whole domains of human labor systems in, in interaction with plants, animals, and microbes. Radical substitution uh, for what might have been there before and tied to both of these two things, a radical break of connection to place, a radical break in the control of generations and the release of numbers so that value-added processes, value, value creation and value extraction based on the management of numbers is dependent on these radically simplified and radically reduced extractive and exploitative systems. That's the plantation of scene. So with that, I will turn it over to Anna for the first part of our joint geofeminisms gig. Uh, I want to add to uh, Donna's uh, thanks to the organizers for this event. And uh, what a pleasure it is to come here to Milwaukee to talk to all of you. And also, for me, a real pleasure to get to work with uh, Donna Haraway, who really helped me come into my own as a scholar through her work. Uh, so I won't go on about it, because I'm hoping most of you know it, but I certainly couldn't have done any of the work that I've done without her influence. Uh, I thought I would start with the Anthropocene, since probably most of you have heard that term for the kind of planetary trouble we're in, and try and talk to you about why the term plantationocene might help us think about the Anthropocene. Uh, 
many scholars, as I'm sure you know, have criticized the term Anthropocene for lots of good reasons. But I'm still invested in using it while also pushing it open, learning to do new things with it. Uh, and in part because I'm actually proud of the climate scientists and geologists that alerted us to the kind of planetary trouble we're in. And I want to be in solidarity with them. And the term Anthropocene is the term for interdisciplinary dialogue across the arts and sciences. So I'm holding on to that while also pushing it open. I think for me too, some of the worst faults of the term Anthropocene, that is its um, call out to a false universality of enlightenment man, that that's actually one of the interesting parts of the term for me, precisely because it reminds us of the historical heritage involving issues of race, religion, uh, European conquest, and other pieces of the story that have had us end up in this planetary mess. Um, I just realized I don't have to lean into the microphone because I have an autonomous one stuck <laughs> on me. <laughs> We can't just go with the kind of analysis of the Anthropocene, however, that we're presented from some other disciplines. And this is where I come back to plantation Ocene. It seems to me that the a planetary analysis with just a bunch of autonomous data points isn't enough to describe the world we're in. Indeed, I want to talk about patchy Anthropocene. That is an Anthropocene that needs spatial analysis rather than just temporal analysis, rather than a set of temporal layers, which I understand the geologists want for reasons internal to their discipline. We need to be able to see the uneven social and natural processes that are going in our world, the, the processes that allow us to use what we know about injustice and inequality in the world even as we look at the planetary shape of some of the problems we're with. And so to look at this patchy Anthropocene, it seems to me the concept that we might start thinking with the plantation is really useful. Be the plantation, as Donna just explained, refers on the one hand to a certain set of historical social arrangements. And I tend to start with the European uh, plantations in the New World, which come from a very particular heritage, and indeed not only displaced Native Americans, but also uh, captured Africans as uh, coerced laborers, uh, and uh, sent the profits back uh, for the enrichment of European elites. That that plantation, with its ecological simplifications, in order to make uh, a enterprise work for coerced labor is the one that we need to start thinking with. And yet it's not enough because uh, that heritage has taken us into the present with lots of changes that we have, um, everything from tenant farming uh, to uh, other kinds of coerced labor re relations as well as enslavement. And now we have machines that substitute for coerced labor, not just any human labor, but for coerced labor in the way that they have us treat the world of agriculture and livestock re rearing. So this uh, heritage of the plantation, on the one hand, has historical roots. On the other hand, is very much with us today. To explain why we talk not just about the plantation, but the plantation ocene, that is the plantation condition, requires some attention to how the kinds of world making that comes out of the plantation doesn't stop at the boundaries of the plantation. It's not just something that's inside a field. Oh, I think I was going to show you some other slides somewhere along the line. But. I want to uh, talk about five ways that the plantation of scene spreads off the plantation. First, the modern concept of race was created in part through the plantation. 
it separated the people who were workers on the plantation and those who were owners and managers of the plantation. We owe a great deal of the ways that race uh, brings us to think that there are different kinds of people with different kinds of jobs to the plantation. That's where the concept of race came into many of its most important modern characteristics. Second, the windfall profits uh, enabled by the plantation created the possibilities of the industrialization of Europe. That, as Sven Beckert showed in his History of Cotton, it was the, the ability to get cotton so cheaply from the New World that allowed the kinds of um, technological inventions and uh, super profits that took off industrialization in Europe. So we owe a great deal of our heritage to the plantation in that way. Third, the model of alienation and discipline inspired uh, of the plantation inspired many other similar and not so similar kinds of adaptations that, as anthropologist Sidney Mintz argued, the factory was inspired by the plantation. Um, fourth, it wasn't just the discipline of people, but the discipline of plants and animals that was inspired by the plantation. Uh, not just the factory, but the farm was naturalized as a place of discipline. I like to think of the Green Revolution as a way of understanding what this kind of discipline involved, uh, where they took all these dwarf plants that just didn't invest very much in their own uh, growth. Uh, they were tiny little plants, and they bred them to, so that when you threw fertilizers and fungicides at them, they would start panic reproducing. And in that panic reproduction, we got the bounty that's called the Green Revolution. So in that sense, plants as well as people were disciplined by the plantation, and we have naturalized that as the human relationship to plants. And finally, pests and pathogens go crazy on the plantation, that, uh, and they spread far beyond the plantation, the plantations uh, gather pests and pathogens because of their ecological simplifications. And they also uh, enable the rapid transformation of pests and pathogens to develop new and virulent varieties, uh, that uh, many kinds of pests and pathogens are transformed by the plantation. And they don't stop at the walls of the plantation. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about the new uh, fungus that has uh, come into hospitals around the world. Uh, that that fungus, I think it's pretty well agreed, comes, uh, was able to develop from the overuse of fungicides in industrial farming, where the uh, fungi adapted to these fungicide uh, 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 soils that were just full of fungicides and became new kinds of fungi that now uh, threaten us. I'll talk about more of these later if there's time, but I want to just go quickly so that there'll be plenty of time for Donna to uh, present her work and for us to talk to each other. If some of these uh, kinds of ways of thinking about the plantation seem rather dark, that is indeed some of the heritage that we're going to have to learn to do deal with. And part of what I'm working on right now is how can humanists, social scientists, and artists uh, tell terrible stories in better ways. That we've learned for a long time that terrible stories sometimes paralyze people. They make readers go away. How can uh, listeners respond to terrible stories in ways that make us interested in the details, make us want move to action rather than paralyzed? To address that problem, I'm working on a big digital project of which I haven't explained any of these slides, but these are all little pieces of it, uh, called uh, Feral Atlas, the More Than Human Anthropocene. Uh, and it gathers some of those terrible stories. One of the concepts, uh, one of the 
the ways that we understand the feral, at least we define the term feral as non-human responses to industrial and imperial infrastructures. So think, uh, things that are out of human control, but are responses to human projects. Uh, to talk about that, we talk about those projects that transform air, water, and land as infrastructural projects. And we, we use, uh, we gather some of our thoughts around infrastructural state changes, that is, world ripping shifts in human non human relations that have to do with these landscape transformations. We've tried to emphasize the world rippingness of them by um, creating some representations that are meant to show you what, how much they've changed the world. This is from a, a shot uh, of corn fields in Illinois, and it's part of a little film we've created uh, that we're calling these video haiku that are intended to illustrate the, um, the, the world ripping nature of infrastructural straight changes. And we've used words that come from our Nordic, Germanic vocabulary that try and give you a sense of the real, uh, the, the, the depth these changes have made. So this one is what we call grid that has to do with the heritage of coerced labor and ecological simplification that I've been discussing. We also have burn. Uh, I'm sure all of you know fossil fuels have changed the planet as well as, of course, uh, nuclear fuels. Pipe. We wanted to talk about how water management is the base of settler colonialism, using water grabs to drive out indigenous peoples and ecologies. And of course, oil management is part of pipe also to support current oligarchies. Take where we look at the speed and scale of long distance transport, which rips apart placemaking, creating a new uh, biological economy. Smooth and speed, uh, we're referring to the physical characteristics of these infrastructural projects that break down local accommodations. Crowd, uh, the stuffing together of organisms with no regard to their health. Dump, the strewing and piling of waste. So we have, gathering these little videos of these, I would have shown you one, but I couldn't get the technology to work to do that, so you're stuck with this still. Each of these kinds of infrastructural state changes allows affordances for non-humans living and non-living, and the sedimentations of these kinds of feral action are the patchy Anthropocene. So, uh, we, we have talked about the patchy Anthropocene as a, a set of socially and spatially uneven responses to imperial and industrial infrastructure. Uh, for Feral Atlas, we look at these spatial kinds of discrepancies, but we're also interested in time. But rather than having a single point from which the Anthropocene starts, we have a set of historical conjunctures, each of which bring into the world uh, new infrastructure building projects that continue to the present. So these aren't eras, they aren't epics, they're rather conjunctures that bring us into, again, this kind of uh, world ripping infrastructural state changes. And so we have four and, uh, that we talked about, and our first one is invasion, um, that this uh, refers to a beginning with the mass killing of Native Americans with European conquest. Um, but we continue it through all forms of settler colonialism in this landscape by architect Fei Fei Zhou, who's one of my key collaborators in Feral Atlas. I uh, is just an opening sketch. We're going to have, we have an Australian Aboriginal artist and a Native American artist who are helping us uh, work with this landscape. But maybe you can see over on one side, we have um, the invasion of the, um, the Latin American cattle invasion, so a contemporary part of the Amazonian uh, occupation uh, together with the something that might come from 500 years ago. So we're, these landscapes are achronistic ways of trying to get at some of the things that matter. I've already slipped in 
uh, some of the others. The, the one that I haven't shown you is Empire, which is about long distance kinds of governance through uh, um, infrastructural packages. Then we have Capital, which you saw briefly, um, and uh, Acceleration, which was my opening slide, where uh, all of the different conjunctures come together uh, the, the projects of imperial rule and industrial commodification spread so that rulers and elites all over the world get a chance to have their own chance to ruin the world through these. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to give you a little taste of that project that hopefully will be finished this fall and come out in 2020. Um, they show you some of the ways that thinking through the plantation of scene maybe brings us into some of the issues of the planet, and particularly what uh, Donna has usually call, usefully called too muchness. And I give her the floor to tell us about that. I think I'll use the microphone. Can everyone hear me adequately? OK, good. If you can't, please raise your hand at any point. And I wanted to point out, and I forgot to say in the very beginning, that I, of course, uh, came first to this place when it was the Center for 20th Century Studies, uh, and have been around for a long time. Uh, so also, I wanted uh, particularly to mark the absence of Richard Gerson and to wish him well uh, as uh, he faces a, a really unbelievably difficult situation. And um, I'm sorry to miss him, and I think of him as being here. And of course, he's the director of the Center for 21st Century Studies, and the reason that Anna and I are here today. So I'm doing the second part of this little gig, and I'm doing it under the label of unblocking attachment sites in the plantation of scene. And I am inspired by this wonderful uh, sculptural performance uh, of Patricia Piccinini. Uh, that uh, this uh, genetic hybrid pork, uh, pig, human uh, scene of inappropriate birthing and inappropriate love, uh, also a very alluring kind of love. Uh, this, call, it, it, this sort of family picture, these kinds of odd kin and inappropriate kin that are also us and not us. Patricia Piccinini, an Australian artist, one of my co-workers in a number of ways, asks a key question for Anna and me, which is how do we take care of our failures? How do we come to love our failures in some kind of way that is materially and meaningfully potent? Not always to look for the fixes or the successes or that which we can somehow either regard as waste, no longer to be taken into ourselves, but that perhaps our most important ethical, uh, affectional um, uh, worlding that we need to be engaged in is seriously rebuilding attachment sites in the care, the care for our failures, the care, the care for that which has put uh, worlds in peril. And I find Pat Patricia Piccinini an amazing woman to think with in this project. Another person I think with is Natasha Myers, um, rendering life molecular. Uh, Natasha is a science study scholar. She's also a dancer. She's also a, woman, a studier of the oak savanna, a woman in love with the uh, Toronto oak savanna and its plants and peoples over layers upon layers of time and space and place. Um, she is uh, deeply involved in collaborations for the possibility of the ongoingness of the oak savanna just as she thought of attachment sites in molecular biology as questions of affectional ecology. Performing attachment sites was one of the ways that molecular biologists working on screen could imagine and, um, and work out the way biochemical attachments actually happened. And without the kinesthetic and performative and affectional ecology that Natasha studied as an ethnographer, the attachment sites did not take shape in knowledge. Uh, and I found her work on attachment sites remarkably suggestive, methodologically and indeed emotionally. Now I'm going to talk to you about two particular examples within the plantation of scene and within this task of taking care of our failures and perhaps rebuilding attachment sites for ongoingness in the face of the kinds of release of numbers 
uh, that the plantation and its, its progeny have brought to us. And I work under the sign of the artist Satoru Abe because he is the favorite artist of my biologist colleague for this part of the project, which is unblocking attachment sites in the Sea of Islands. That is the biologist Michael Hadfield, who is himself a developmental marine biologist. His career in the daytime uh, is studying marine embryology and its biochemical signaling pathways, including its multi-species multi signaling pathways. Uh, such that, let's say, a bacterial, uh, well, let's say a, a, a free-swimming larvae in the water column somehow have to receive a signal at a certain point in their life to know that they need to come down and settle on some little patch of empty space and start undergoing major transformations of form and, and function uh, so as to become the sexually reproducing part of their particular critter. And Michael is interested in what the, uh, what the chemical signaling pathways are, including the other species that are involved in sending out cues that compose the holobiome um, that is the marine developmental world that he studies. But at nighttime, and which is to say all the weekends and all the other time, Michael, who lives in, and works at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu, uh, is, uh, is in love with Hawaiian tree snails. Um, fell in love with them because of pattern, the love of their shells. I mean, look at these things. How could you not be in love with Hawaiian tree snails? But of course, anybody who falls in love with Hawaiian tree snails is uh, in the midst of one of the great extinction cascades of the planet, where the great majority, which is to say about 90% of previ exi previously existing species of Pacific Island tree snails are already irrevocably gone. Uh, and holding space open, as Thomas Van Doren might say, uh, holding space open for the possibility of ongoingness for those who remain is in our hands. If not us, then whom? And there is very little time. So that Michael has, for four, approximately 40 years, conducted the research, the biological surveys, the developmental studies, built the alliances um, that are at stake, that are required for the remaining Pacific Island tree snails to just maybe have a future, just maybe have a future. So what does it take actually to build the attachment sites, to build the possibility of love in place for, for Pacific Island tree snails? First of all, one must acknowledge the importance of the research stations of the Pacific Ocean, which are colonial uh, inheritances from the, uh, the European powers uh, who, uh, who established the uh, marine research stations all around the world, most certainly including uh, in various areas around the Pacific Ocean. And what the Eastern Seaboard scientists of the North America called outdoor science was done in the Pacific, where indoor science is done in the genetics laboratories and the biochemical laboratories and the physio so forth laboratories of the eastern seaboard. Not that there weren't marine biology stations of great importance on the eastern seaboard, witness Woods Hole, for example. Or if you're thinking of Europe, Naples, uh, the kind of ancestor of all of them. But the Pacific research stations are part of what enables a Michael Hadfield to, achieve, to be there in the first place. And then second of all, to have the tools to begin to rebuild the possibility of ongoingness for the Pacific Island tree snails. M many of these tree snails have been brought into captive breeding programs in the laboratory. They exist because of envi environmental chambers. But in addition, Michael and his colleagues have been involved in building predator fences to keep out the snails, the rats. Um, the multiple introduced, um, introduced species that eat all the tree snails, who, mind you, only have babies about every five years. They only reproduce a few times in their entire life. They live in one place. They, are not, they, they do not easily transplant. They live on a single tree for their entire lives. There's incredible speciation. It's a kind of an island biogeography, really, because every tree is almost an island in the Galapagos Island sense. So you get extraordinary diversity uh, from these highly vulnerable organisms who uh, uh, have a very low reproductive capacity, such that if it's, if it's broken, their chance of making it is about zilch. Okay? So building predator tree snails to keep out hikers, to keep out uh, rats, pigs, other introduced species, goats, 
uh, predatory snails, so forth, so on, involves this really interesting uh, set of technological design issues to figure out which kind of predator of which size it, uh, is likely to get into that little area of an ohia tree and gobble up all the snails. So you have a, a, a kind of craft innovativeness uh, that intrigues me a great deal in the history of biology. Um, but in addition, of course, Michael and his friends and colleagues are involved in biological survey work all across the, the Pacific, most certainly including the Northern Mariana Islands in, with their um, post-World War II imperial history in relation to the United States being a big part of the story. And Michael ends up uh, as an individual re-undoing and redoing himself uh, as an inheritor of his own uh, European, North American, and white formation as a, a colonial uh, scientist redone by his alliances with Pacific Island students, with Pacific Island places, redoing the notion of the Pacific Island into the Sea of Islands, a whole change of spatial perspective. And one of the example that I will give uh, here is on Pagan Island in the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, has itself a fascinating story I could go into in more detail. The part that interests me now is that post Fukushima, the Japanese wanted to bring their so-called low-grade nuclear waste and dump it on Pagan Island, which involved uh, deep dredging of the harbor, and then mine the, pe the uh, Pagolan resource, the, uh, the mineral resource of the volcano, in order to bring it back to fertilize soils for uh, essentially industrial of uh, agriculture in, in the developed world, including Japan. Michael and his colleagues uh, mount an international um, program uh, that involves uh, the exposure of the, dump, of the nuclear dumping on this particular island in the Pacific and involve them in very interesting, complex alliances with Chamorro families that had been expelled from those islands in the first place. Uh, in part by volcanic eruption, but also in part by the history of nuclear testing in the Pacific and the rest of it. So that the alliance of the uh, families that continue to uh, return to Pagan Island to mark the graves of their uh, ancestors and, and, and have plans of repossession of the, perhaps resettling of the land at some point, um, the multiple kinds of complex alliances for international agitation to bring down the project of shipping, um, uh, shipping the waste to Pagan Island. They won that particular fight only to find um, the U.S. military reawakening plans of turning Pagan Island into a free fire zone uh, bombing range, essentially, so that uh, the Save Pagan Island and the, uh, in, in uh, languages of the uh, Northern Mariana Islands, uh, not just English, a kind of anti-nuclear uh, project is essential. If you care about tree snails, you were involved. Michael now regards that Michael began as a pure scientist who really thought all he had to do was study his science in his free time. He could be a good citizen. What Michael comes to realize is that doing his biology, that this is, it is part of his biology to be involved in the anti-nuclear activism, to be involved in spreading the word about the beauty of these snails, to be involved in the, the really intimate uh, micro care in the lab of harvesting the leaves and scraping off the right kind of fungus and making sure that the nutritional balance of the snails is just so, the, the kind of taking care of the, of the little guys in the lab and the care and nurture of graduate students and postdocs. And for years, uh, the funding of a summer program uh, followed by um, you know, uh, science degrees, both undergraduate and graduate degrees, for uh, students from the various Pacific Islands, matching, up, matching them up with mentors, agitating with the National Science Foundation for heaven only knows how long to keep funding uh, these programs, putting in place science-educated Pacific Island students to run their own scene. Um, in the Pacific if there is to be a, a vital rehabilitation of Pacific Island natural social ecologies. That's what counts as doing biology. That's what counts to working as working with the attachment sites for a guy who at one point thought it really had to do with identifying the chemical that signaled the settlement of a larva. It has to do with that. Of course it has to do with that. But it has to do with that as a whole way of taking responsibility for worlding from a great species extinction, the Pacific Island tree snails, who are displaced by sugar, 
pine, and tourist plantations. Okay, tourist hotels are a crop of the plantation ocene, as sugar and pineapple are crops of the plantation ocene, uh, as the uh, uh, gardening and pet trade uh, bring, in, in a, uh, bring in species that become feral in the sense that Anna has given us. The plantation ocene produces the extinction crisis of the Pacific Island tree snails that utterly redoes my friend as a biologist. The second example that I want to give has to do with um, plant, animal, microbial, and human numberings. Um, it has to do with the great acceleration, the uncoupling of generations and the release of numbers that produce these astonishing J curves of the post-World War II period. The really amazing, uh, I was, when I was born, there were about two billion people on the planet, give or take. When I die, if I, if I believe the life insurance tables, if I drop dead um, uh, in the appropriate year, there will be about 8.5 billion human beings on this planet, and we are not going to count the industrial chickens, because they will number in the tens of billions annually. Uh, and I don't think you can count the people without counting the chickens, without counting the rice, without counting the wheat, without counting the disease pathogens, without counting the fungicides, that these are multi-species matters. And these numbers were released um, in the great simplification, substitutions, and transportations of the plantation ocene and its followers. These curves are the fruit of Malthusian thinking. Very simplified, kind of interesting if you take it as a really simplified kind of model building for a particular kind of problem. Uh, put a bunch of yeast into a sugar solution and watch the change in the yeast population until the sugar is all used up and then watch the population crash. Uh, watch the, watch the, uh, the ratio of what gets eaten to what, who eats and what gets eaten and count the numbers of the relation between eaters and eaten and you've got a Malthusian way of approaching the world. Units plus relations over time in a highly simplified way which can be useful for some very particular kinds of problems but very quickly became the kind of imperialist racism and misogyny that we are all very familiar with in terms of what got called the population bomb and the rest of it such that even to mention the eight plus billion people by the time I die, if I'm lucky, not the eight point billion isn't lucky, it's if I die then that would be lucky. Uh, anyway, point being, uh, even to bring this up uh, raises the charge of you are no longer a feminist, you've just gone over to the devil's side, this is pure racism. You can't even talk about human numbers at all if you are on the left, if you are progressive, if you are a feminist, because if you do, you are a neo-Malthusian. I don't care how many times you say you're not. Well, I'm not for a lot of reasons. <laughs> I think not to talk about it is to give it over to the enemy. Uh, that not to talk about it is to ensure that we do not own the problem of the disproportion of generations and numbers. Um, and that if we think from a plantation of scene point of view and a multi-species reproductive justice point of view, we will, try, we will try to think about how to reestablish the control of generations and numberings by the players whose lives and deaths are at stake. And we will take seriously what sister, what sister Care and the black women activists gave us with the concept of reproductive justice. And we will put that together with them, with the water defenders, with the uh, animal turn people, with the, um, the, with the many allies we've got to really reimagine what multi-species reproductive and environmental justice might look like. So here are two instances of fertility crisis in the plantation scene. The excess fertility of the industrial chickens, uh, what it actually takes to produce a scene like that picture of those chickens, um, the kind of, of distortion of science and scientific institutions, the distortion with the feed to, to pound conversion ratio stuff of University of California Davis and the rest of it. Well, Cornell first. Uh, never mind. There's a whole story to poultry science. Um, the, uh, the management of, of these are disease, these are epidemic friendly systems. These couple highly constrained human contract labor. So the degrees of freedom of a chicken farmer are approximately zero. Uh, as they have to sign contracts that, that fix them to every single step in the raising of the chicken to market size. This is highly coerced labor. Uh, uh, that's ca they're called independent contractors, yeah, in your dreams. Um, the global quality of this, 
of the raising of multi-billions on the excuse that it's required to feed the growing population of human beings uh, who are becoming more and more meat friendly, even as we might speak a good line otherwise. Simultaneously, I have juxtaposed that to another picture which looks friendly, but I assure you is not. Uh, this is Biopolis in Singapore. It's all very green. Leslie Green is the one who tells us that green is the new white. That's way oversimplified, but yeah, stay with it for a minute. Uh, the, uh, the Biopolis uh, of Singapore, this really fabulous uh, set of, of, uh, of fabulated built structures uh, for urban agriculture, urban, urban, urban gardening, urban green in Singapore, very, very science-friendly city, extremely interesting city, that regards itself to be in the grip of this thing called a low fertility crisis. White America regards itself in the grip of a low fertility crisis. Uh, think of, of um, uh, Congressman Ryan uh, arguing that we need more babies. Guess which babies he meant? Uh, even while he opposes immigration, uh, you know, serious immigration of uh, Latin American or, or Asian or Middle Eastern peoples. Um, the, what, the low fertility crisis of Sweden, of Denmark, of France, of Singapore, of Taiwan, of South Korea, of Japan, the low fertility crisis of its, in, in, of its quote, native population, close quote, uh, not reproducing itself. The human numbers, the rate of human reproduction falling too low is regarded as a major crisis by, the, by all of the developed nations on this planet right now because indeed they have fallen below replacement rate so that by 2100, at about 11 billion people if we're incredibly lucky, the numbers on the planet will start leveling out and slowly decreasing. If reproductive rates that are, that, uh, that are falling now everywhere, pretty much, except for a few places that are most oppressed and most subject to permanent war and extraction and, and exploitation, a few places where human reproductive rates remain very high, very, uh, anyway, if they don't continue to fall worldwide, it'll be more like 20 billion people by the end of this century. Uh, or more. If they do continue to fall, it will level out at about 11. That is almost impossible not to happen. So, the, so figuring out how to do this in a less deadly way uh, is surely our job. Uh, my slogan is make kin, not babies, and particularly not rich babies. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I told I mean, I, we laugh, but uh, I can't tell you uh, how some of the young women, especially, that I work with think, oh, you mean me? I can't have a baby? It's not what I said. <laughs> but I did say make kin not babies or make kin not population. How to have many fewer biogenetic babies and really have a pro-child, pro-baby world. How to really care about the born ones. Uh, what would it actually take to have a pro-child world? We surely don't have one now. Um, that, those are the areas, that, the issues that I care about most of all, and I regard this as a Plantationocene-generated question, because I think there is no way in hell that human beings would have tolerated the kinds of densities we've got now, now had our love of place and our capacity to care for place and each other, including other critters, uh, had that not been broken by the apparatuses of the plantation and the capital of seen there is no way in hell that the release of numbers of the green revolution and its popular and its human and uh, plant and animal and microbial explosions there's no way in hell that would have happened uh, had the the connect, had connection to place of the plantation of seen not been so systemically and so globally broken um, i think anyway i propose that that is a non malthusian way to think about the a framework of the problem. Um, and I want to end with the work that is done um, in many places for recoupling generations and multi-species reproductive justice. And I do it with this mural on the, val on the wall of the Valley Youth Theater in Phoenix that was done by a group of youth and, and artists working with them. Some of the youth were also artists, but not all of them. <laughs> um, if, uh, the Black Mesa Water Coalition, a group of Navajo and Hopi uh, mainly young people, uh, many of them with scientific degrees, including environmental studies degrees from Stanford or where have you, uh, working in the Navajo Nation in the Colorado Plateau uh, around water justice and around solar energy and around the consequences 
of the draining of the aquifer to um, move the coal from Black Mesa in slurries to burn at the Navajo generating plant, which is being closed down irrespective of the jobs lost. Uh, the burning of the coal that allowed the pumping of the water over the mountains into the Colorado River to feed the, des the cities of the desert southwest. Um, the multiple kinds of alliances and ways of thinking geomorphically, geologically, that the Black Mesa Water Coalition uh, folks do, and the kinds of alliances they invite in, um, in all sorts of ways, with wool growers, with weavers, uh, with urban activists of various kinds, with scientists, with solar panel designers, who could design solar, solar energy that would really work with people who live in highly dispersed uh, environments, um, such as exist in the Navajo Nation. That a kind of alliance with the Black Mesa Water Coalition uh, is one that I've written about and taken seriously for a while. Um, it's, um, I won't talk about this, but it's a great novel. You must read it, uh, The Man with the Compound Eyes. If you want to think from the point of view of Taiwan, about Odkin committed to environmental justice. Attaching Odkin is what I want to use the last years of my life for, unblocking decolonial multi-species justice. So I want to end it actually with strawberries, because I live, in, I live in Santa Cruz, and I live on the Monterey Bay. Probably a significant proportion of the strawberries all you guys eat uh, get grown there, or perhaps in Mexico, Driscoll will be a major producer. Whether or not to boycott Driscoll is a, an ongoing debate among progressive people, blah, 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 blah. But I'm interested in strawberries because it then reconnects with what Anna is doing in all sorts of major ways. The love of strawberries, the beauty of strawberries, the, the scent of strawberries, their sensuality, uh, the, the, what stra uh, you know, strawberry, who could not fall in love with a strawberry? Uh, and what does it take to, to rebuild the capacity for loving and eating and sharing strawberries that aren't packaged in plastic, that aren't grown on land that is so heavily uh, sprayed with fungicide that Canada, that I used to think of something girls got, uh, you know, a candida, inf a candida infection is something every female person in this room knows about. It is not the candida that Anna is talking about that has been released as a worldwide resistant plague by the overfumigation of soils, including for strawberries, which are fumigated to the, to the nth degree and then indeed covered with black plastic to hold in moisture, hold in the gases they're fumigated with, and then the plastic is plowed into the strawberry land, and you've got seriously ruined land in amazingly rich um, uh, areas along the Monterey Bay or in the Salinas Valley or, or elsewhere, and you've got labor forces that are um, on the whole not documented, subjected to incredible kinds of insecuritization. Uh, you have an apparatus of the plantation of scene that is in every bite we take, and I haven't even talked about plastics. So instead of not taking those bites, my premise is, is that once you eat something, you are accountable in the world otherwise than you were before you ate it. Uh, that if you, once you know something, you can't unknow it. Once you cultivate the pleasures and the love of attachment, you become affectively, cognitively, in every imaginable way, uh, your craft skills manually, you become part of, you, you must become part of building the attachment sites, rebuilding the possibility of living well with each other as the means, and not just the end, at the end of the day. The means have to be multi-species, reproductive and environmental justice, not just the end. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we want to open, the, Anna and I are going to talk with each other for a minute or two, mainly to give you guys time uh, to figure out what you want to do and say, and um, so that the adrenaline rush of listening uh, damps down a little bit and we can have a conversation with everybody. But Anna and I thought we would have a little conversation with each other first. Uh, and I can't say another word, so... <laughs> well, uh, I'll say... Uh, just a, a small thing about uh, what a pleasure it is for me to be working with Donna, even though I don't think I'll have time to talk about the substance of this. But at lunch, uh, she gave 
what I think of as a very provocative and exciting argument that the that we should define the plantation of scene in relation to uh, its disruption of reproduction, whether for too muchness or too littleness, um, in a non Malthusian fashion. And I've been thinking about that since lunch uh, and been really excited about how, for the kind of work that I'm doing of trying to understand the planet and the plantation, that might be really. Interesting, and I felt really thrilled to have this little argument to uh, try and get some traction with and think about about how the plantation creates what I was thinking about as a kind of unlimited biological economy for certain kinds of organisms, but not others. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to take it any longer than that because I'm worried I, I want to give everybody time. But so I'm just throwing it out now as how generative I find it to be thinking together with Donna. So I'd like some examples from the feral atlas of the uh, organisms that catch your, the critters that caught your attention uh, most, you know, is most vitally helpful for thinking about the patchy Anthropocene. Uh, well, can, can I continue with the unlimited biological economy mm -hmm. part of it? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think I've been, as I mentioned with the candida example, thinking about how patho pathogenic fungi are transformed by the uh, plantation, not even the plantation ocene, just the plantation in the very ordinary sense of the term. Of course, uh, pathogenic fungi are part of the ecologies of all the worlds we know. If we didn't have fungi that were able to break things down and to uh, change life, we would be in big trouble that for succession depends on pathogenic fungi. So this is not meant to condemn pathogenic fungi, but they respond really well to uh, the conditions of the plantation. And uh, two things happen. One is plantations gather uh, pathogens. Uh, make putting them in a reproductive cycle that they weren't in before and allowing a kind of state change in how pathogens can get out in the world. And second, uh, plantations allow the rapid transformation of pathogens uh, through either rapid evolution or uh, through the, the uh, combining of populations that once were separated into hybrids and that all of these things create new kinds of uh, virulent uh, pathogens that weren't there before and that spread far beyond the plantation. And that what in, the, in terms of what I was thinking about, uh, about since lunch, about how to think about this as a kind of reproductive disorder, uh, one might remember that pathogens in general are known for not killing off their host species because once they kill off their host species, they're going to die too. So, but once you create what I'm thinking of right now as this uh, unlimited biological economy, then you can start killing things much more crazily. And the plantation ocene is the creation of that set of interlinked plantations on a planetary scale that creates the possibilities of this unlimited biological economy through which pathogens can circulate uh, in a way that they hadn't before. And that, that uh, indeed, if you compare organisms, maybe that's enough. I don't need to go on. Yeah. Just a quickie, you, you guys probably already know this, but the suffix scene, C-E-N-E, -E, in all of these ways of naming temporalities and spatialities, comes from the Greek kainos, which is a thick present, which is a, t uh, a time of present, a time of now, uh, a time of, rec of recentness, Holocene, uh, that the plantation of scene is the time of, um, of the recent. Um, it's not just any old kind of time. And we like that sense of the ongoingness of these complex uh, time-place relationships. So, you guys. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Hey, Nigel. Uh, what, uh, microphone on the way. <laughs> Um, well, amazing, and too many notes. 
um, that I had to write down, so bad you. Anyway, um, I was thinking about the J, uh, the, 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 the slide of all the graphs, and one of the things about the x-axis is that it's got time on it. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I'm always wondering about that piece, that if you spread that time scale out into something that wasn't, say, in the last 150 years, what do those things look like? And, um, and that leads me to this question about so much of this seems like it's, as you say, in the scene, very presentist and very much about where we are now and where we've been in the last 150 years or maybe 500 years and, and, and whether your perspective on these kinds of issues changes if you make it a 10,000 year span. It does, and I think the way you draw timelines is a function of the question you're asking. Um, and this kind of timeline is drawn in order to show an inflection point in the post-World War II period that marks a transformation in um, com uh, complex or com um, what Anna called conjunctures. Um, and I think anyway that one of the things people should always think about in looking at some of these uh, at any of these instruments is that the way it's drawn is absolutely a function of the question asked and that may or may not be visible. Uh, and uh, this, kind of, this kind of graph is intended to show the inflection points of the post-World War II period. Therefore, it is compressed in these ways. But uh, I think there's more, uh, because I, I've, I've thought about this too, that the common idea that you could make a J-curve at any tiny point in these big J-curves. And that might be true, but I think there's a bigger story than that, that 10,000 years is good, because many of you know that if you're thinking about these geological epochs, the last 11 and a half thousand years is what they call the Holocene, a time of incredible climate stability for the Earth uh, compared to the ice ages that preceded it. And that during that Holocene period in which you know, humans were definitely a part of the mix of ecologies on Earth, uh, if you look at the rate of extinction, it's not very great. And then suddenly, in the last 150 years, boom, you know, it's hit the sky. So something has happened that's different from how the Holocene was. Thank you. And one of the things that Anna emphasized about the Holocene is that it was the time of remaining refuges, uh, refugia. And as the way that as biologists might use that term, there would be uh, environmental catastrophes that might be the result of um, exhaustion of soils from agriculture and war. There were all sorts of catastrophes, natural and social, to use those categories. But that uh, what you've got are refugia from which um, uh, landscapes, waterscapes could be reconstituted. Um, significantly, that what uh, one way of defining the Anthropocene is uh, the obliteration of refugia. There really are no refugia from which that we really are looking at these moments of uh, the limits of homeostatic adaptation and re, uh, repopulating, re refilling uh, broken places. Yeah. Hello, thank you both. Um, I wonder just the same way that you expanded um, the etymology of Ocene, if you could expand a few other terms um, like attachment sites and um, Malthusian. So uh, tell us more about th the meaning of that word and how, uh, how it functions uh, for you now. Quick, quick. Um, I was raised up a biologist, and I thought of a cr attachment sites as those areas of molecules that other molecules are going to have, you know, the right kind of electron valences, or uh, th that there's going to be either repulsion or bonding or weak bonding or strong bonding. I thought of attachment sites as a biotechnical term of great utility in biochemistry, and then uh, as decay in life has set in, uh, more and more, I think of attachment sites as the some really fundamental, and again, this is from Natasha, uh, the fundamental um, uh, uh, complex of processes that produce the living and dying world, and indeed much of the abiotic world, works from tropisms, works from the, uh, the, the attractions, drawings, attachments, weak and strong, as well as repulsions, that uh, the fundamental tropisms 
and I do this in front of a media studies kind of audience on purpose, the fundamental tropisms that produces material semiotic being, including living and dying critters, work through attachment sets. That's all. It's, it's a metaphor, but it's not merely a metaphor. Uh, what was the other one was um, Malthusian. Malthusian. Well, Thomas Malthus, uh, the, the essay on population, the late 18th century, uh, you know, depended very much on what was going on in, in British, British imperial expansion, the British East Indi India Company, looking very much at uh, the question of the relationship of growth, of growth and management of populations to uh, the existence of resources um, and a, an argument that, the, uh, that resources, particularly food, expand arithmetically whereas populations grow logarithmically and they will be out of sync and there will be crashes and mass starvation and whether uh, social policy should intervene or not was the political debate of the day. This is a quick and this is a real cartoon version. Uh, but that Malthusianism becomes a kind of a dominant discourse across the ideological spectrum. Marxist, you know, uh, imperialist, which is, aren't mutually exclusive categories either, but um, that Malthusianism, there is nobody talking about population uh, from, you know, through the 19th and, and through the 20th centuries and into the present without being seriously contained by the history and premises of, of um, the elaboration of Malthusian discourse. I remember how shocked I was as a young biologist learning that the uh, rates of settlement on a coral reef um, and the population composition and the rates of recruitment and um, birth and death and so forth and so on were the techniques for studying that were borrowed from the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. Of course they were. Natural economy and political economy require the same tools and the same conceptual apparatus. Why should I have been surprised? Uh, that's a, that goes beyond the Malthusian issue, but I, I think we, we should be alert to the ways our cog not that these cognitive apparatuses are bad, but we should be aware of the complex of historical conjunctures through which it became possible and even necessary to think that way. I, I want to say one thing about Malthusianism precisely because this has not been my work and I don't know the answer to the question you were asking and was only trying to think about this at lunch when Donna said she was coming up with a non-Malthusian uh, way of understanding why the plantation of scene was a reproductive disorder. And so I, I was trying to figure out, OK, how do we operationalize that? How do we turn that into a way of working with these materials? So I asked, uh, well, if you just counted the number of kinds of beings that were dependent on each other. You know, the problem with the Malthusian is there's only two things you can do. You can eat or be eaten. That's it. So I wondered if all of the different kinds of beings, and you know, not drawing some lines yet about what counts as a being and a different kind of being, but if you could layer all the different kinds of interdependencies, uh, if that would get you at least started on a non-Malthusian uh, understanding of reproductive rates. So that's my first attempt. Looks like there's somebody, you've been, had your hand up from the beginning. Um, hi, Anna and Donna. <laughs> uh, I'm, this is a slightly different kind of question to ask you two to reflect on maybe moments of change or turning in your own work. Um, I've you know, followed behind both of you since I was an undergrad at Santa Cruz and too frightened to take a class with Donna, <laughs> too intimidated, uh, which was a terrible mistake. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, 30 years now into my own sort of scholarship and thinking about what drives changes, is it a linear, you know, sort of process of always on the same path or have there been big moments or experiences or learning new things that have altered the direction of that path for you. you go first. <laughs> well, well it's, a, it's a hard question. The first thing I can think of to say is that I was hearing about this new trend in political science that where you're supposed to pre-register your field work, that is, tell some centralized authority not only what your hypotheses are, but exactly what you're going to allow yourself to see and not see. And I feel really good that by chance I picked a field which 
asks the opposite of people, which is to not know what you were doing in advance, but to instead learn something in the process, <laughs> rather than just reproducing all your own idiocy over and over. Uh, so I feel lucky uh, to have, have had the chance to learn something and, uh, and to have had colleagues at Santa Cruz that also have uh, encouraged that kind of learning, so. Yeah, I think the, uh, I have a kind of similar um, thing to say, but uh, my sense of my own biographical trajectory as a thinking, feeling person in the world uh, is that it has been radically shaped and reshaped by events utterly out of my control. For example, the Vietnam War and landing at the University of Hawaii uh, when McNamara is constructing the electronic battlefield. Um, and I feel like I landed on the New Haven Green. I knew nothing about the New Haven sugar families. I knew nothing about the Hawaiian land struggles and the replacement of the taro and pig farms by the hotels, on, and on we go. I knew nothing about the Hawaiian tree snails and the importance of the rats and the sh from the sugar fields, that, that it, was, it was being somewhere. Uh, that uh, utterly transformed what I needed to know and, and feel and with companions um, so that the, the radical contingency of it is both very personal and very much more than personal. And, and I was lucky enough um, not to fit very well. All of my organisms died in my experiments. That kind of did in my biology career. I was really a death dealer. Uh, I, being only partly facetious, it, the, the, when you don't fit very well, which is true of most of us, very few, if you let yourself not fit, willy-nilly, um, you're just as likely to survive in the world, including the academic world, doing what you love as doing what you think people want you to do. Uh, in fact, probably more likely, because uh, you're like, more likely to be interesting. Uh, so whether or not we survive in the academic world is not in our personal control for the most part. So we may as well do what we love and get the support to do it. And I say this with full cognizance of the fact that when I began my professional career, um, which was as a uh, untenured, untenured track adjunct professor teaching um, science to this ontological category of people called non-science majors in Honolulu, fashion design majors and tourist industry management majors and people who weren't going to do real science. Uh, anyway, uh, nonetheless, I did get a tenure track job ultimately. When that happened, about 85% of the United States uh, university faculties were faculty on tenure track. Now it's about 15% with a highly exploited adjunct labor force, which all of you know about. So I give this advice about uh, uh, letting yourself be at risk, knowing full well that one has to be safe enough to survive that risk, and that the conditions of that kind of safety, both personally and collectively now, are not the same. And that, that it's uh, very much more difficult for the young people in our care uh, than it was for me. Actually, in, this, in the way of talking about danger, let me say, because I, I don't think anybody else will say this to you, for those of you that are students, that I understand, uh, well, if this is anything like where I'm teaching, uh, something called professionalization is all the rage that asks you never to speak to anybody, never to read any books, and just to get ahead with your career. And I think if you want to have a really boring life, that's a really good idea. <laughs> and if, you, if you're in scholarship because you care about something, You've got to have some kind of play groups, collaborations, somebody who you're building something that seems worthwhile with. Because just keeping your head down and going forward, you know, and all of those advice books, and they tell you what to do all the way till you get to tenure. And I can imagine a person who followed those, and then they get tenure, and they're completely bored because they didn't bother getting interested in anything along the way. So on the off chance that you were the person who didn't like professionalization anyway, I'm giving you <laughs> encouragement. This is um, sort of a follow-up question uh, to uh, the previous one on attachment sites um, for, for Donna. 
Um, I've seen you uh, read, read, uh, read you using the phrase, um, Mary Louise Pratt's uh, phrase, uh, contact zones. And I'm wondering what attachments, you seem to be using them similarly. What, does, what do attachment sites do to, for, for you that contact zones do, don't? Uh, I tend to uh, proliferate words um, a little bit prom uh, promiscuously. Uh, and so there isn't always a good reason you know, for that, other than falling in love with a paper, uh, and uh, you know, and finding it reigniting thinking, which which Mary Pratt's book *Imperial Eyes* and Jim Clifford's use of the term, and so on. For me, ideas are attached to people very quickly. I may not know the person at the time I read something or hear something or find out about something, but I'm very likely to know that person as a human being as quickly as possible. Their ideas are very personal. That said, there is a difference. Contact zones, uh, as, as uh, Mary Louise Pratt proposed the term, had everything to do with power asymmetry um, in the zones of contact uh, in processes of colonization and imperial encounter, uh, in which uh, what, uh, kind of cartoon notions of domination would be of rather little help, that one might need uh, much more complex notions of what goes on in asymmetrical encounters. And so it really, contact zones really emphasizes the power charged notion of an encounter, of a spatial, spatial, temporal spatial encounter, but it foregrounds space. The attachment site is much more straight up a biochemical metaphor, trope, um, that isn't quite uh, so, um, uh, predetermined in terms of the, the issues around hierarchy and asymmetry. And uh, it, doesn't dis it doesn't require that one think oneself out of that box all the time, uh, which may be a bad thing, but it depends a little bit on, on what one's doing. Is that, is that yeah. a, a start? We have microphone needs. I could give you mine, but then I couldn't talk. <laughs> Uh, I guess a lot of our questions have been about names, and I'm not going to ask you to define anything or talk about anything. Uh, I would just uh, we we spent some time today discussing the plantation scene, which is one name for our current predicament. We also have the Anthropocene, the Cthulhu scene, uh, the capitalist scene, uh, and I guess my question is, you know, the, all these names come with their own like shift of focus and sort of restrictive parameters. And I was wondering how seriously we are supposed to take these names. Like, is plantation a scene the name we're proposing? Or, uh, you know, is it just one aspect of the Anthropocene? Like, I'm just asking about, like, sort of discussing these names. Uh, I'm quite serious about plantation of scene, frankly. And I'm kind of hoping that it's contagious. Uh, and that it, you know, gets, you know, sort of feral, even. Uh, because I think plantation of scene has a lot of potential to reframe action as, well, as well as um, other things. Uh, I care less about Thulu scene, uh, even though it's mine own. Uh, although I am very interested in uh, it's not being Lovecraft's, it's not being the monster Cthulhu, that it's, but rather it's more the Thanos scene, the in and of the earth, the in and of the ongoing earthlings, and um, that, it, uh, that we are now, as, it's not just an ancient matter. I'm also uh, very uh, w uh, uh, cognizant of and not uh, disavowing the Greekish nature of all this because I want attachment sites rather than political correctness in terms of I want to uh, uh, rework my own heritage in ways that open it up perhaps and remember the, the degree to which the Thonocene is in the areas of Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean, the degree to which Naga uh, and the uh, tentacular and snake-like ones are very crucial to the formulations of some of, some of the European ideas that became formalized in philosophy and mathematics and, and otherwise. I'm really interested in the way some of these names foreground uh, trading zones co or contact zones uh, over longish, long periods of time. And I am more than a little interested in uh, remembering acutely that let's say uh, the, the notion of climate change, um, if we're, let's, let's take us up to the circumpolar north for a minute. Uh, and to the peoples of the circumpolar north who speak the various um, Inuktitut, Inuit languages, 
uh, and who have uh, who share uh, a word throughout the different uh, dialects and languages of the circumpolar north of Sila. I say it Sila. I don't know how it, uh, it's supposed to be said, but uh, it usually gets translated into English as weather. Um, whereas the people who are using the term tend to mean uh, a, a really uh, a large set of phenomena and process, processes that, in, that are, that are the, the breath of the earth, the fogs, the mists, the, the, the breath of the land, the uh, breath of the peoples, the ongoingness of, of, of a, breathing, uh, a breathing world where ice and water and land are in strong interaction. And groups of, of people uh, with acute knowledge, for example, of how what, what a, a, southern, a southerner, that is to say a scientist from the south in the north, what a southerner, th southerner might call a change of refractive index because of a, of a moisture change, a, a fog quality change in the area that will relocate certain uh, astronomical phenomena otherwise, or the building up of sea ice. Uh, in the summer because of melting further north that piles up the ice more onshore that screws up the hunting, the summer hunting uh, of people who depend on that meat in their freezer to get through the winter because southern meat's so expensive, so on, so on. The language of climate change, while, co while comprehensible uh, to uh, various people work, uh, living in and working in northern communities, various Inuit peoples, um, is not, is not a, uh, an idiom um, is not an indigenous idiom. And I'm interested in the contact zones between scientific and indigenous idioms, not in order to say one is better than another. And here I'll go back to the contact zone language, because I think this is power charge stuff. I'm interested in the way uh, Inuit speakers can define um, meteorological and land, sea, ice, people, uh, animal, uh, lichen changes differently in ways climate scientists might learn from, and that you can't do that without certain kinds of language openness. Uh, so that I look at the Colorado Plateau and the history of the Navajo peoples in the Roosevelt era and the, the uh, period of um, the New Deal and the imposition through the notion of carrying capacity and unsustainable uh, grazing and erosion and stock reduction and their absolute refusal to engage with Navajo knowers and doers around notions of husro uh, or of complex uh, living, dying um, interrelatedness uh, and instead imposed all, uh, stock reduction and modes of land holding uh, it, that to this day make it almost impossible to conduct really serious um, co-study, co-alliance, co-policy formation around a really acute problems of drought uh, and um, uh, numbers of horses on the land and what the tribal councils are doing versus the chapter houses versus, that it, it's still almost impossible because it was a failed contact zone, seriously failed. And I think we have a chance not to be such total idiots. <laughs> um, thank you very much for this scintillating discussion, both of you. I was particularly interested in the idea of the patchy Anthropocene. So I was thinking, well, yes, the plantational scene is the laboratory yeah, for um, certain forms of uh, industrial agriculture, uh, later corporate agriculture. And um, so in, but, but at the same time, I think you've stressed that it's a spatial concept. So if you think of the plantational scene as a spatial concept, then what are and where are these patches? You know, what is this, the, the quality of the patchiness? And what is the temporal quality of the patchiness? I mean, does the plantational scene kind of leap across centuries and then intensify, you know, in the past 150 years? So how are we to think of it? I mean, basically, I think it's a geopolitical question which is latent in both your presentations. For me, uh, on the question of the plantation of scene, I'm really delighted that it seems to be have been as productive as uh, in ways that I never imagined. That there's a whole Sawyer seminar in Madison devoted to the plantation of scene. I mean, I think it's really wonderful. But uh, in the work that I've been doing in Feral Atlas, I put it aside in a way, but uh, as the stimulating force for a bunch of other patch making processes, which I tried to indicate with those words like burn, crowd, pipe, dump, that those 
each of those could have an ocene with them. You know, you could have the dump ocene if you wanted to, but that uh, that that patch making comes from varied kinds of infrastructural processes, uh, including the plantation. And uh, the question of how you know a patch when you see it, it seems to me it's really important not to divide the world up as if it were a jigsaw puzzle, as if there were discrete uh, patches, but rather to allow the patches to be incompatible with each other and uh, to have their own dynamics uh, and overlap and, in fact, uh, contradict each other upon occasion that uh, this project that we call Atlas has attempted to stretch the idea of the map so that many, many kinds of things count as maps, that we have a uh, Australian elder who drew a painting for us of his people, the monitor lizard people who are being threatened by the uh, invasive cane toads in northern Australia that are killing off the lizards. And uh, that he has drawn a picture of his country uh, through this painting. And it doesn't resemble a GIS map at all. In fact, you can't even place it on it. But for us, it's a map that helps to define the feral dynamics of a particular area uh, and a particular set of processes that have to do with a country and his relationship to country in this area. So we've tried to keep open the many kinds of feral processes that allow multiple kinds of patches and that my uh, feeling is that to make Anthropocene work as well as we can, we need to allow lots of overlays and juxtapositions that we can't limit it to a single knowledge formation that then divides the world up into discrete uh, bits, but rather to, in fact, encourage these kind of multiple uh, practices of knowing and telling through which uh, we might get to know the sedimented feralities that are causing us so much trouble and also uh, offering zones of possibility. Um, I think that this relates uh, in a major way to what you were just speaking to. Um, and something that I'm interested in as it relates to your comments uh, in the beginning on storytelling um, and on the means of telling these uh, tragic, horrific, catastrophic stories in a way that um, will be listenable or with a capacity to absorb rather than, and to enact rather than paralyze. Um, I'm interested in the uh, interrelation between um, the mode of datification and uh, visibility as it pertains to that. It's appropriate, I think, that uh, this slide is up. But um, I think a, a good example of what I'm speaking to is uh, the form and function and transmutability of radiation as a, uh, as a force and a presence that is invisible until datified and then it is made visible. Um, and I, I think that that's one example in which those things need to um, work uh, interconnectedly in order to convey stories and to tell them uh, in, a, in a way that can be absorptive. Um, so I'm just interested what your thoughts are, both in, in relationship to the feral archive, which I think is such a, addresses this at such a, a, a ground level, but also in uh, theoretical work as well, which uh, ends up taking the form so much of, of written and spoken work and has, in my experience, troubles being translated into uh, specifically visual work uh, as well. Do you want to go first? Uh, thanks. For that question, and for me, uh, I really respect these curves, but I also see them as the challenge for those of us who want to move beyond as if these were autonomous <coughs> data points. Uh, and just to tell a story from 
uh, one time when I saw Will Stepan present these figures. He's the climate scientist that developed this SOFA dashboard. And uh, he put up a, a slide of uh, J-curve of the number of inventions. So, and you could see it goes up in the 19th century. And someone raised their hand in the audience, and they said, inventions, that's just a function of the law of patent laws. So you change the patent laws, you're going to change the number of inventions. And, he had to sort of say yes. And I think every single one of those curves is like that, that if you looked at the kind of political economies, the institutions, uh, the knowledge making practices, these curves are mainly showing that rather than data in some kind of neutral, natural way. And so, but rather than just throw them out, it's a challenge then for us to do these other kinds of explanations and storytellings and representations. And that's exactly the point of this Feral Atlas project is to try visual, uh, oral, uh, uh, scientific, uh, many kinds of ways of representing materials. Um, we have a story, for example, about radiation, just to give one example, by historian Kate Brown, who worked in the Chernobyl exclu exclusion zone. And she writes of the boom in commercial uh, blueberry picking that's happened there. Uh, but the blueberries, of course, are incredibly radioactive, and the commercial buyers buy them all. And they have this, exactly what you're saying, they visualize this data with their own Geiger counters. And they just buy the, radioact the more radioactive, the cheaper the price. Uh, and then they mix them all together and uh, send them around the world and create, I mean, back to the question of what counts as a patch. They have recreated the sense of patchiness. Now we have a patch of the distribution of blueberries coming from the northern Ukraine is now a set of patches uh, that this process has initiated and brought us into. And the question of how best, I mean, in that case, she's just a real beautiful writer and storyteller. But others uh, have tried to do it. You know, we, we've included, I mean, maybe you've seen the uh, incredible film by Chris Jordan Albatross about the albatrosses that eat the plastic, so that's part of it. So people who where something visual really captures it better than perhaps an essay on a marine plastic could have. So we're trying uh, exactly as I think in the spirit of what you said to come up with multiple ways to communicate about these feral processes. Uh, I think the only thing I want to add is that, uh, that data are made but not made up. Uh, but they have to be made, and, and the care and feeding of data, the nurturing of them, uh, the unwinding of the stories in which they're embedded from the very beginning, and, and then they proliferate other stories, that data um, uh, are, uh, you know, have that kind of quality. And that um, I think one of the ways I learned that was as um, uh, a baby assistant professor in the history of science when my colleague wrote a little book called Death is a Social Disease, Bill Coleman, historian of biology, where he studied the uh, development of 19th century uh, political economy and, and public health. And he followed the surgeon, a surgeon from the Napoleonic War, post-Napoleonic Wars, who got it into his head uh, to count um, the dead of the different arrondissements in Paris and the, uh, comparing the, the death rates to the populations of different arrondissements and was able to visualize and propagandize and narrate as a, um, as a medical officer differential death rate by class. So that the ability to show as fact differential death rate by class uh, emerges out of very particular kinds of practices from from war, from the development of urban neighbor, uh, urban industry, from uh, questions of public health, and on, on and on we go. It's made, but not made up. Uh, and the you know we can I think uh, each of us have rather favorite examples of the care and feeding of facts, uh, and that we need to in a, the political climate we're in in Trumplandia and Bolsonaro land. And by the way, you saw that he was disinvited from the American Museum of Natural History. <laughs> uh, God Almighty, that he was anyway. Uh, we live in a, in a world post-science wars in which folks who talk like us were called relativist. 
right? As if the the um, that what we're, what people like Anna and I and probably most of the people in this room feel like we're doing is showing, narrating, participating in, uh, engaging with the work, the pro, the the affective and other kinds of work, technical work, affective work of uh, making data, you know, making uh, making facts and their care and feeding, which is exactly the opposite of made up. That kind of relationality is precisely the, the antithesis of, of relativism. It is in fact the, the, the work of making strong knowledge claims uh, that engage our hearts and, as well as our minds and hands. Um, and that I, you know, I think of Bruno Latour as a really major ally in terms of what counts as a strong knowledge claim. So I think this actually is part of that ongoing problem and that the degradation of the media that we're all uh, experiencing and the degradation of public, uh, public trust in any kind of shareable reality has to do with a real serious lack of public literacy on the care and feeding of facts. And this probably, we probably should pull to a close after the one more comment question. Um, this is a, I guess, maybe slightly abstract question about the kind of analysis that you guys have been doing and um, what you're sort of, and building off what you were saying just at the end, uh, what it is that you see, um, do you see it, at, do you see the goal of something like naming the plantation is seen or the kind of storytelling that was discussed in the last question as being um, to like illuminate certain aspects of our world in order to spur us to some kind of action and if so what would that look like and and as in by what how could you judge sort of the efficacy or the um usefulness of various things if not by such a um sort of uh some what what is the standard by, by which you would judge those or do you see it as um or do you see like a better understanding of our world and our time as being the goal in and of itself um, and making us more uh, rooted or something in our, like. Both and. Um, I think that it, I actually feel, believe that it is a good in itself to, to have a thicker and richer um, grasp of, of where, what, who is, are. <laughs> uh, that there's something um, terribly important about living fully, um, and that knowing more at the end of the day and than in the morning is a pretty nice thing. Um, and, you know, holding on to that privilege, you know. Uh, and uh, it really matters uh, whether we figure out how to remediate the strawberry lands uh, uh, along, the, along the Salinas River and elsewhere, and it really matters whether we figure out what to do with the Pacific Gyre plastics, and it really matters uh, whether the uh, uh, ep whether the epidemic friendly pathogens that permeate uh, most of our processes for sustaining uh, coming on soon eight billion human beings, not to mention everybody else, um, are um, are um, brought back into some kind of tolerable uh, and step down levels, and it matters that the means are not violent. Um, that is really not okay to imagine authoritarian or techno fix. Um, solutions and it's really hard to be a peacemaker um, to, uh, in these domains and I, yeah I think it really matters um, and ongoingness matters now whether we know whether something worked or not in some kind of, of trying to throw yourself into the future and decide whether something's going to work or not I care actually a little less about that I mean I care that something works and I think ways to measure it really matters but I think we're sort of um, too driven by um, a futurist approach as opposed to living in a thick present. Um, so I'm informed by the anthropologist um, who's worked in Australia for many years who recently died, Deborah Bird Rose, who talks about her uh, teachers in, in uh, the uh, Aboriginal lands around Darwin who taught her that a serious person faces those who came before uh, so as to live, so as to perform one's obligations in the present, and the present is about 100 years long, it's the time of living memory, so as to leave lef less ruined country to those who come after whom you never see. Uh, and I like that way of thinking about how to be an accountable and serious um, person. 
It, it's hard not to. Oh, well, we're, we're here, we're here. Okay. Very fine. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was incredible. I think Anna may have a little more to say. We have a reception upstairs on the ninth floor of Curtain Hall. Uh, please join us then if you want to continue the conversation. Anna says there's always more to say. Let's go eat.